Will you stand with me, please, as we look into God's Word this morning? I'm reading from Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 41. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, Oh, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Father, we... Thank you, as always, for your precious word. We understand this to be the infallible and inerrant word of God to us, to reveal to us the God that we could not know otherwise. Not subject, Father, to scientific uh, experiments or uh, any kind of proofs or evidence like that, but beyond that, you've given us way more than we could ever hope for. You've told us, Father, that the whole universe represents to us an evidence of your power and your your Godhead. We see in creation not only your power to create, your power of, of creativity, but we also see your omniscience, how much you know. We also see your personality, how you have built into people something that is unique. So, Father, we do see you everywhere. And we thank you for that. The Lord, in the most special way, you've revealed yourself through your word and through your son, both of whom we not only honor this morning, but we seek to understand what the word is saying and what the son has said in this passage of scripture. Help us. We have those who are representing us in far corners of the world today, Father. Pray especially for the Losey family as Young Daniel is back in the hospital, needs this heart transplant, uh, looks like almost immediately. So we pray that you will sustain them, help them as they seek what the doctors would do. And Father, even in the midst of all of this, we pray that the testimony that has been so bright from their lives will continue in Asia where they have been working and in the translation work that they are doing. Commit them to you. Pray for them. Pray that they will be in our hearts and minds all week. Bless us now, we pray, as we turn our attentions to you away from all the concerns of the the week, all the concerns of the time that's going to follow, whatever it is that's on our mind that would hinder us from hearing you, we pray that we'll put it aside just now and listen for the voice of our Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And if you haven't already, please uh, turn with us to Luke 12. Hope you have your Bible. Appreciate that you bring them every week as we look into God's Word, whether it's, uh, you know, the pages that turn, which I like because I hear them, or whether it's your mobile unit or whatever, you have your Bible with you. Jesus is coming again. That's the message of this wonderful passage that we've been studying the last three weeks. And he is coming the second time, just as he came the first time, literally, physically, personally. He will set foot on this earth and all will change the moment that that happens. And in this passage, even though he hasn't even left yet, he's already teaching his disciples about the fact that they need to be ready for his 
next coming, which they certainly don't fully understand yet, but will eventually when they look back on these days. He wants them to live expectant holy lives. As always, when there is emphasis on prop prophecy in the Bible, it's aimed at helping us live holy lives, at motivating us to love and appreciate and know the God who is so glorious that it incentivizes us that way. So how do we live that life? Well, in verses 35 through 40, which we've looked at the last couple of weeks, he urges us to wait expectantly, to wait expectantly, to to be constantly in, in, the, in our mind knowing that, God could, that Jesus could come anytime. Now in verses 41 through 48, he's going to urge us to work earnestly. And so the two things that should occupy us in thinking about Jesus coming again are to wait earnestly, expectantly, and to be working at the same time. Both are necessary. Thessalonians got mixed up on that. Remember that? They got so enamored with the imminent coming of Jesus Christ as Paul had taught them that many of them apparently left their jobs, took up laziness as a habit, waiting for the Lord to come. And so Paul wrote to them and said, listen, if you don't work, you don't eat. Let me just make this very practical. You need to be working at the same time that you are waiting expectantly. So as Jesus has been in those verses 35 through 40, emphasizing this expectant waiting, Peter jumps in. Not an unexpected event, right? Peter constantly had that tendency. And Peter jumps in and he says, well, Lord, who, who exactly are you talking to there in verse, in verse 41? He says, are you, are you telling this parable for, for us, by which I think he means the 12, the apostles, or are you telling this for all, for the whole crowd that's there? Good question. Jesus does not answer it directly. Instead, he immediately launches into another parable, this time emphasizing that those who are ready, those who are ready will be working. They will be faithful. The parable contrasts a faithful servant or a faithful manager with an unfaithful manager. And it becomes clear by the end of this parable that Jesus is contrasting true believers with those who are only professing believers. That's a huge difference, beloved. And we have to realize he essentially is answering Peter's question by saying this parable is for everybody in this crowd. Now, there were some irreligious people, three classes of people, the irreligious who don't care. They've long ago written off religion, make no pretense, would never darken the door of a church, have no interest whatsoever. But then there are religious people who think they are believers, who are, think they are saved, think they are headed for heaven, who are not because their lives are not being lived in faith in Jesus Christ, to be living still for self, and it's, it's a hypocritical facade that they're putting on. And then there are those who are true believers. And Jesus here is contrasting those latter two and he says the true believer is one who is not only waiting expectantly, but he is working earnestly in the cause of Jesus Christ. He's like the Minutemen in the Revolutionary War, right? They were waiting expectantly with rifle in one hand, and they were working earnestly with plow in the other hand for what might come. And that's what Jesus is urging here. That's the attitude that I'm looking for. Mere professors have long ago given up the idea that Jesus is going to come in 2,000 years. I'll explain that some other way. But that Jesus is going to come, no. They, they are not expecting him anymore. True believers are. And because they expect him and because they have seen the glory of who he is, they are working. They're part of, the, they're part of God's kingdom even now. So in this parable, what Jesus does really is contrast the possessors, those who really possess eternal life, and the professors, those who claim Christ, claim some way salvation and really do not have it. So we have an excellent opportunity to, to see where do we, which camp do we fall into here. Three ways that he contrasts possessors versus professors. 
So number one, possessors are faithful. It's a simple, easy one from this passage, right? Possessors are faithful. Professors are unfaithful. They're unfaithful. Verse 42, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will sit over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Possessors are faithful to their mission. Faithful managers feed the household. Now, this was obviously applicable to the disciples in Jesus' time, right? To the apostles. Remember what he told Peter when Peter was making his confession after the resurrection of Christ. Do you love me, Peter? Yes. Then feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Three times in that passage, Jesus emphasizes, I want you to be feeding people. I want you to be teaching people. I want you, he tells the disciples, teach them all things that I've commanded to you. This is your function. Obviously, the disciples were particularly doing that on a full-time basis, but the clear indication from Scripture is that this is the responsibility of every believer. Every possessor of faith in Christ will want to share that with others. In fact, the Bible is, is pretty clear that God has gifted us to work earnestly, right? 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, 1 Peter 4, these are great passages that talk about the spiritual giftedness, the way that God has, for every true believer, given them special gifts in order to minister for him. Romans 12 is another passage that speaks to those. And he says in Romans 12, 6, having gifts that differ, not the same, but having gifts that differ according to the grace of God, let us use them. He didn't give us gifts to let them lay around, Right? Now, the emphasis in the New Testament on our giftedness has to do really with our work in ministry in the church. But beloved, it's equally important to understand that the gifts and abilities God has given us are intended to extend far beyond the walls of the church. That they're intended to enable us to let our light shine before others so that they can glorify our Father who's in heaven. So wherever we are, in whatever work or school or occupation or whatever, we are representing Christ. And so we need to be those who are working. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, you'll remember this passage, he says, this is how one should, should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards of the mysteries of God simply means we know the gospel. And people that we're around every day don't know the gospel. So we're stewards of the mystery of God. And he says, therefore, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. We are to be about the work of our Lord, whatever our secular work is, whatever our secular career and so on. Tim Keller. Some of you know and have read some of Tim Keller's books or heard some of his sermons. He was one of the, uh, one of the sermons we used on a DVD one time. Tim Keller pastored a church in Virginia for about 10 years, and then he taught at a seminary, Westminster Seminary, for about five years, and then he decided he was going to start a church in New York City. This was in the late 80s, and everybody told him, a church in New York City? Are you kidding? You can't start a church in New York City. I, I, an, an Orthodox church? He said that we've done a study of this. The remaining congregations in New York City are still there because because they've adapted Christian teaching to the issues of tolerance and pluralism and compromise that constitute liberal theology these days. You can't go in there and preach Christ. They said, don't, don't think you can go tell people that they have to believe in Jesus. That's considered way too narrow-minded for, for, these, for these New Yorkers. Keller insisted that he was going to do it because God was asking him to do it, and that the new church would, in fact, teach the Reformed faith, orthodox theology, that it would emphasize the inspiration of the Word of God, that it would emphasize the deity of Christ, that it would teach that we need to be spiritually regenerated. And even though he was told that these doctrines would be rejected hopelessly as, as outdated by the New Yorkers, the church was established. Now listen to this testimony from Keller. He says, nobody ever said, forget about it, out loud. 
but it always hung in the air. Nevertheless, we launched Redeemer Presbyterian Church, and by the end of 2007, it had grown to more than 5,000 attendees and had spawned more than a dozen daughter congregations in the immediate metropolitan area. The church is quite multi-ethnic and young, average age about 30, and is more than two-thirds single. We were as stunned by this as anyone. Some of you may know Bob and Diane's uh, son Kyle goes there along with his fiancée Nicole. And beloved, I'm not suggesting that everybody will have the same success as Keller did, but I'm suggesting that we need to be faithful in the face of adversity, whatever it is. The results are up to God, right? The results are up to God. But we cannot let somebody convince us, no, you can't teach it this way. You can't stand for truth in this day. You'll be laughed out of town. Even if that happened, let it be. In the end, beloved, we win. Faithfulness. True believers are faithful to the message. They live the message. They speak the message. They are all about the message of the gospel. So what about mere professors? What about them? Verse 45. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, what is there there? No faithfulness. He's decided the master isn't coming, therefore he can live however he wants, do whatever he wants, be whatever kind of person he wants. This may be, this is a professor claiming somehow to have faith in Christ, may still be attending church, but he or she has long ago given up any hope that the Lord is really coming again. Not living in the light of the possibility that it could be today. They have gone back to their old selfish pre profession lifestyle, even though they may put a good facade on it. They're concerned about others only as it may help them out. This is the professor. They feel no sense of accountability to a master that they think really isn't coming. Doesn't really matter. Maybe, maybe didn't even rise from the dead. Maybe that was just a spiritual kind of thing. And so it doesn't matter. They are unfaithful because they are unreal. They're not genuine. There was an interesting story a few years ago. U.S. Airways. I guess they're U.S. Air now. I don't know what they are now. Airways or Air, one of the two. But they, 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 they decided to do a promotional. They had all these business travelers, and they thought, you know, what we'll do is we'll offer a half-price fare for any of them that want to take their, you know, wives or husband, whatever, along on a on a business trip with them, and then we'll get these testimonial letters from them to emphasize what a great airline we are. So they ran this promotional from sh some short period of time, and then they sent a, a bunch of letters out to the wives or husbands of these people who had actually taken advantage of this, asking how they enjoyed their trip. What they didn't anticipate was the flood of letters that they got back that all had the same single question, what trip? What trip? They never took a trip. Which meant, are you with me? I, this, I thought that was a pretty good line. I don't know. <laughs> Husbands and wives didn't take their husband or wife with them on a trip, but they took somebody. Okay, now, now you're with me? Okay, now we're together. I don't ever want to leave you that far behind. I am so sorry. You're asking, what trip, right? And I'm saying, well, what trip? I can only imagine there were some interesting conversations about faithfulness in a lot of homes about that time, right? And about accountability. Are you faithful? Hebrews 10, turn, let's turn to that one. And kind of, then kind of hold your place, keep Luke, but hold in Hebrews, we'll be back there. But Hebrews 10 it's a, it's a dire passage, beloved. There are, there are some of these that are just so convicting in the New Testament. And Hebrews 10, 26 is one of these where the writer warns this. Hebrews 10, verse 26. 
He says, for if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, that means somebody who has really been there, they've been involved, they've heard the truth, they've made this profession, but then they've gone back. He says, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. That's a strong statement, isn't it? To make a profession of faith in Christ, but yet go back to live as though he didn't matter, as though maybe he didn't even exist. The Bible has nothing to promise except judgment in that case. And you, don't have, you know what? You don't have to look further than Jesus' inner circle to find such a person, right? Judas was such a person. He's an indication of how close you can come, how, how near to the truth you can be and still miss it. And I know you're all saying to yourself, yeah, but I'm not Judas. Well, let me ask you, when was the last time you uttered the words, Jesus Christ, in the presence of anybody other than one of your church friends? When was the last time that you didn't kind of walk away ashamed when somebody began to mock and you were afraid to say anything because you knew that they would look down on you or think you were kind of one of those stupid, you know, ignorant evangelicals or something? When was the last time? Because don't those things put us right in the same company as Judas? And, and doesn't it cause us to say, wait a minute, am I, am I a professor or am I a real possessor? of the Lord Jesus Christ. Possessors are faithful. Professors are unfaithful. Secondly, possessors are wise. Professors are unwise. Possessors are wise. Professors are unwise. Verse 42, back in Luke 12. Who then is the faithful and wise manager? Who is wise? What does it mean to be wise? Well, clearly in this context, the wise person is the one who is living in the expectation of the coming of the master, right? The wise person is the one who is able to look ahead. The wise person is the one who can see beyond this life into the next. The wise person is the one who can see beyond time into eternity. And so one of the characteristics of a possessor is that they are living in light of that fact while the professor is just living for here and now. It's all that really counts to them. I love the example. There's, a, there's a, there, well, there many great examples in the Bible, but Abraham is one who's an example of a wise servant. You remember how Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17 and so on got all these wonderful promises from God. Your, your descendants are going to be like the sand of the sea. This land is going to be your land. I'm going to bless you and those who... Bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Abraham had all of these wonderful promises to God, from, from God. And yet there's, a, there's a, a passage that gives us an insight into his inner life in the book of Hebrews. So if you're in Hebrews, just turn over to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, and look at verse 9. Well, let's start with verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called... Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham was call, uh, obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went not knowing where he was going. You remember how God asked him to go and Abraham said, where? And God said, I'll show you later. Um, and, and he went. He followed the Lord. And the Lord took him to this land of promise, which he never, ever owned except for one cave where he buried his wife. It's the only part of it he ever owned. So verse 9, by faith he went to live in the land of promise but he lived in it as a foreign land. Living in tents with Isaac, his son, and Jacob, his grandson, heirs with him of the same promise and yet not having anything. For he, look at this in verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. In spite of all the wonderful promises that Abraham had for this life, what was he really looking forward to? He was looking forward to what it all represented. He was looking forward to life with, 
with his God and Savior in heaven. That's what it tells us was his mindset. That drove Abraham's obedience and his faithfulness. Abraham would have never been like the guy in Luke 12 earlier in the chapter. Remember in verse 20, the guy that got rich in this life and he was laying up all this uh, treasure for himself, figured he had so much he was ready to retire now and so he's going to have to build bigger barns because he didn't know where to put it all. Remember that? And just as he was getting ready to enjoy his retirement, the Lord came to him and said, you fool. Like we mentioned when we studied that, it's the only place in the Bible God directly calls somebody a fool. It's not the only ones that are foolish, but wow, he he nailed this one. Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Because they're sure not going to be yours. What was his problem? His problem was that everything that he thought about and that he'd lived for and paid attention to was just his earthly possessions, right? It was all what he could accumulate now. It was all what he could do here. He reminds me, he reminds me, there was a great, great quote one time. We live in Southern California. Red Sanders, a long time ago, was coach of the UCLA football team. And they had a great rivalry, of course, with USC, being in the same town, often you know, competing for even a national championship. And so when they met each other on the football field, it was always, um, it was always like, a, like a, a battle. And somebody asked Red Sanders about that one time, about the rivalry with USC. And he said, well, it's not really a matter of life and death. And then he said, it's much more important than that. <laughs> it's much more important than that. And I'll tell you, if you lived in L.A. about that time, or if you lived anywhere where there's this great rivalry going on, and I'm sure many of you have, you know that it seems like it's more than life and death, right? But beloved, that's how some of us live our life. As though what we see here and now is all that there is. And God is saying, no, 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 no. It's, your existence is much more important than that. Don't you get that? Tells us in 2 Corinthians 4. It's not the things that are seen that are important. The things that are seen are transient. 2 Corinthians 4, I think it's verse 16, 17, somewhere along there. The things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are the things that are real. So it's just another way of saying the same thing. The faithful servant is wise. He sees that. And so he lives in the light of the fact that it's not just about here and now. You got to live. Sure, you got to live now. You got to make a living. You have to get along, right? But you got to live with one foot in time and another one in eternity as a faithful manager, as a faithful servant. But what about the professor? How does the professor live? I saw a cartoon in the New Yorker. It's been a few years ago now, but it showed two pilgrims stepping off the Mayflower. And they were obviously discussing their goals. And one said to the other one, well, my short-term goal is religious freedom. My long-term goal is to go into real estate. <laughs> Probably was in the right place to do that, right? Real estate ended up being pretty good opportunity in the new world. But you see, beloved, if our long-term goals don't extend any further than this life, then we're way too short-sighted. And that's a sign of a professor. Possessors are looking further into the future, beyond this life, to what comes next. Professors, they're all tied up in this life. They're all about what I can do here and now. Jesus is coming again, beloved. Must be ready. It's a third characteristic. See in this passage, possessors are rewarded, professors are punished. Say, the Bible will talk about punishment. We've got a God of love. Listen, did, you ever, did it ever occur to you God couldn't be a God of love if he wasn't also a God of judgment? Did it ever, did it ever occur to you? If God loves, love hates sin, right? has to. Sin is wrong. Evil is wrong. Wickedness is wrong. Only somebody who loves 
would have to judge because he has to take care of sin one of these days, and God has promised he's going to do that. In fact, the second coming of Christ is very clear. That's going to be the first item on the agenda. He's going to gather those who are still living on earth, separate them into the sheep and goats, and the goats are going to go one way, and the sheep are going to go a completely different way. Because he's going to make an end to sin because he's a loving God. But here he's telling us the possessors are rewarded, the professors are punished. Look at verse 43. Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over his possessions. Great reward awaits possessors. Faithful servants, servants who are full of faith. You know, the greatest reward will be to be in heaven, right? To be with the Lord, to see Jesus. John was so looking forward to that. He had known Jesus. He'd seen him here on earth for his whole life. But he says in 1 John 3, 2, I can hardly wait to see him because the next time I see him, I'm going to be like he is. I can't wait. Not only will the power of sin be gone, but the presence of sin will be gone. And John could hardly wait to see Jesus. What we roared awaits those Heaven will be ours. Everything that you've ever sacrificed here, beloved, believe me, will be restored 10,000-fold in heaven. I read a story one time about an elderly couple. They came to Philadelphia one night, and it was, it was late. They didn't have a hotel room, and they came to this hotel, and they asked the clerk, can you, know, can, can you give us a room? And he said, I, I don't have any rooms. The whole city is, is, is overrun by this convention that's going on. And they said, well, if you don't have any rooms, can you tell us somewhere where we could get one? He said, I, I, I don't think there's a room in the whole town. I, I don't know where to send you. And then he got thinking about it, and he thought, well, I'm going to be working all night. My room is available. And he felt kind of bad for him. And so he said, I'll tell you what, if you want to stay in my room, you can stay in my room tonight, and uh, no charge. You can have my room because it's not going to be occupied tonight. And so they took the room. The next morning they got up, they invited this young man to breakfast as he was getting off his shift. And the man said to him, you know, he said, young man, you're, you're too good to be working in this hotel. He said, how would you like it if I brought you to New York and built a hotel for you? And that's exactly what John Jacob Astor IV did. He went back to New York, he built the Astoria Hotel, he brought this hotel clerk from Philadelphia and put him in charge and he became one of the great hotel men in the in the world in his time because he was faithful. I don't know if the Lord is going to give you a hotel because you're faithful. I don't know what God will give you in this life, but let me show you some of the things that God is going to give you. Turn with me to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. Oh, believe me. The reward that God has in store for those who love him are absolutely Amazing. In Revelation 2 and 3, most of you are aware, Jesus is talking to, he's writing to John, to seven churches that existed in Asia Minor at that time. And enough time has gone by, these churches have been established, and they sort of have a combination of good and bad going on, like most churches. There's a couple of them that he actually has nothing but good to say about them. There's one that he has basically nothing but bad to say about it, but most of them are a combination. And he separates in his comments to the churches the possessors from the professors with the word conquerors, or your Bible may say overcomers, depending on what translation you have. But that's how he identifies those who are real believers, who are true in their faith. And so throughout the second and third chapter of Revelation, he gives many promises to those who are overcomers. And look at this. Let's just start chapter 2, Revelation 2, verse 7. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is, by the way, in the paradise of God. It's the reversal of Eden, and you're going to be there if you're a believer. Do you like that? If you don't like that, you don't understand what the Bible's all about. Be in Eden, eating the tree of Life? Chapter 2, verse 11. The, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Man, that's enough reward right there because everybody else will be hurt by the second death. And if you want to see why, look at Revel or how, what that means, look at Revelation 19 and 20. In chapter 2, verse 17, he says he will receive, the, the conqueror will receive some of the hidden manna 
and a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. What's that all about? You have an identity in Christ, beloved. Every one of us who are in Christ have a new identity. Some of us don't even understand what that identity is. We're beginning to understand it. We will know then the full extent of the identity of what it means to be in Christ and to be adopted and redeemed and predestined and, 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 and the sons and daughters of God. And there will be a definition of who we specifically are because there'll be as much diversity in heaven as there is on earth and more. Have a new identity in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 26. You'll have authority over nations. Think about that. Some of you are saying authority over nations. I don't want that. <laughs> Believe me, whatever God gives you, you will not only want, you will excel at. Chapter 3, verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I, listen to this, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Imagine that. Jesus will say to the father, this is Dan. I want you to meet Dan. This is Tim. I want you to meet Tim. This is Kathy. I want you to meet Kathy. They belong to me. I'll confess his name before the father. Pays to be a possessor, beloved. Chapter 3, verse 12. He has made a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Say, what's Jesus' new name? I don't know. He talks about having a new name, Revelation 19. Everybody always asks, what is the name? I don't know. That's why it says, you don't know. But you will know. Chapter 3, verse 21, I will grant him to, listen to this, sit on my throne. Imagine sitting on the throne of Jesus Christ. I, these things stagger my imagination. They go beyond anything I can really understand. Chapter 2, 21, verse 7, if you were to go to 21, I will be his God, he will be my son. Does that intrigue you? I mean, does that tell you what a savior that you have in Christ? What a privilege, what a joy, what an amazing inheritance we have from the God who is our father. So what about the professor? What about the unfaithful servant? Surely there's at least a place for him in the corner of heaven, right? Surely, surely there's some space for him. But beloved, I'm afraid not. That is not his destiny at all. Jesus says to the unfaithful servant, back in Luke 12, we better go back there, Luke 12, verse 46. He says of the unfaithful servant, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. That means the unbelievers. That means those who are separated eternally from God. This is language that, express, that is explicitly describing an eternity away from God. They will be cut off without remedy. Say, are you sure about that? Well, I'm sure, beloved. Psalm 73, verse 27. Psalm 73, 27. Here's what this one, that one says. It says, For behold, those, those who are far from you shall perish. You will put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. It's not just words that matter. It's our life showing the reality of our faith that matters. Revelation 21, verse 8, re removes all doubt if you're anywhere close to that. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, that's the same word we have in Luke, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, this portion, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Hell awaits, beloved, the unfaithful. Those who by their life deny his lordship. That is the fate of the unfaithful servant. He claims Jesus as his savior, but he lives as though Jesus 
didn't even exist, really, outside of maybe Sunday at church. He's part of those that Jesus identified in Matthew 7 who will one day stand before him and say, wait a minute, Lord, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's chilling, isn't it? That's the unfaithful servant. That's the one who's putting on a good show. That's the one who's putting on a facade in this life, but there's no reality. That is the end of the professor. There's only one interesting mitigating note in verse 47, Luke 12. It says, and that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But verse 48, but the one who did not know, did not, and did what deserved a beating. In other words, he doesn't have the knowledge that this professor does. He will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required, but from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. In other words, lesser punishment is reserved for those who do not know the master's will, do not understand as clearly as others. The more light, the harder the punishment. I, I can't begin to describe to you what that means. It's like, you know, we have the, the opposite thing as we've seen before with regard to heaven. There are degrees of reward in heaven just as there are degrees of, and, and, and similarly, there are degrees of punishment in hell. But believe, believe me, that is no, <laughs> that should be no solace to anyone who is sitting here this morning because you've heard the gospel. You've had light, beloved. And if you've been here week after week, you hear the gospel week after week. And so the light that we have had here makes us fully responsible. So are we professors? Are we just, are we possessors or are we just mere professors? I like this story about an old evangelist, Sam Jones. I can remember my folks talking about him in the old days who lived in the South, was, was a kind of an old-time Southern evangelist. Um, we may make fun of them, but believe me, there was a lot of truth in what they were presenting. He used to, this guy used to have a quitter's night. So during the course of his week of revival meetings or two weeks or whatever, he'd have a quitter's night. And on that night, people who were repentant would bring symbols pictures, whatever they could find, representing the thing that they were repenting of and that they were turning from and that they wanted to be no part of their existence anymore. So they would, you know, bring different things. Some, some of them would bring, you know, bottles of wh uh, whiskey representing their, their, their tendency to drink too much. Some of them would bring pictures of mistresses to throw in the fire. Some of them would bring catalogs representing their covetousness. Some of them would bring books and magazines that were not appropriate or edifying, a lot of things that they would bring. Probably not a bad practice. Kind of fuels in our mind, outwardly, what we're hopefully determining in our, on the inside. But one night, there was an elderly woman, and everybody, you know, considered a saint in that church. She came to the front, and she had nothing with her. So they closed the service, and then Sam Jones went over to her, and he said, Aunt Sally, I see you've, you've come forward indicating you want to repent, but you didn't, you didn't bring anything. What, what possibly are you repenting of? And she said, well, she said, I'm repenting of this. I'm repenting that I ain't done nothing, and I'm going to quit doing it. I'm going to quit doing nothing. She recognized that to, that to him who knows to do right and does it not, to him it is sin, James 4, 17. Here's the good news, beloved. None of us can be a good servant on our own. We can't. Thankfully, there is one who has been a good servant on our behalf. All the way to the cross, he obeyed the Father perfectly, and he did it for you, and he did it for me, so that we have 
forgiveness if we will simply ask for it. But once we understand that, where Jesus is going with this, the works don't save us, the faithfulness doesn't save us, it's the Christ who's done it for us that saves us. But see, once we catch a glimpse of who he is, and once we understand his glory, once we see the wonder that's Jesus, we begin to live like this because we want to. If you don't have the want to, you need to examine closely. So we can be by faith in him who has been a good servant on our behalf. We can be one too. Possessor, not just a professor, let's pray. Father, we confess that uh, we, are, we are not very good servants. We are not. The best of us here this morning, Father, have enough sin as I think it was John Bunyan said, we have enough sin in our prayer to condemn us to hell, and we do. We're selfish. We are putting ourselves forward. We are proud. We, Lord, the list goes on and on. But Father, to those that you've regenerated, to those who by faith have clung to the Christ who has done all of this for us, to those, there will certainly be the desire to get it right. We've not only met our sin, but we've turned from it. And when it overtakes us again, we turn again, and it becomes the habit of our life to be confessing our sin and to be right with you and to be, well, to be doing what this passage says, to be waiting expectantly and to be working earnestly in light of the fact that you're coming again. Thank you that you came once. Thank you that you're coming again. Apply this to our life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.